Hello, I'm Arthur Riesch. This is a work about solving one variable word equations in free group, and this is a joint work with Robert Clarence, who is my PhD student. So let us fix some notions. The free group we will be dealing with is generated by a gener set of generators sigma. I will also call them letters. And we assume that they are disjoint with the inverses. Okay, so sigma intersection with sigma 2 minus 1 is an empty set. I will denote the ne neutral element by epsilon. There is a natural cancellation or reduction on the on the elements of the free group, so a a to minus 1 reduces to epsilon, and the normal form I will denote as, as written here, and this is just whatever is obtained after the, the cancellation, and of course this doesn't depend on the order of, of the cancellation. The elements of the free groups for us will be just the normal forms of every possible word over sigma and sigma to minus 1, and the operation in the free group just takes the two works, concatenates them, and uh, computes the, the normal form. Okay, nevertheless, I will use the words <coughs> from sigma and sigma to minus 1 to denote elements in the free group, uh, because this usually leads to no confusion, but to distinguish between the equality and in the free group and the equality of, of strings, I'll just denote this fancy uh, equality to denote the equality in the free group. So in particular, two words will be equal if their normal forms are equal. Okay, so the word equation that we will be dealing with is given by two strings, uh, u and v, and we want to interpret this equality between them in the free group, <coughs> and those two strings consist of, uh, well, our sequences of letters and variables and the inverses of them. Okay, so the variables, I will denote that every variable also has its inverse, which are syntactically different, so th those are different things. And the substitution assigns to every variable a word or uh, an element of the free group. And this naturally, and of course we require that if we have a substitution for the inverse of the variable, then this is the corresponding substitution for the variable and taken the, the inverse. And such a substitution naturally extends to sequences of letters and variables and of their inverses just by a homomorphism, so we concatenate, concatenate them all together and then take the the normal form. Okay, and uh, substitution is a solution if after the substitution and computing the normal form we get the, the same element in the free group. For instance, if we look at the following <coughs> equation, we want this long word on the left-hand side to be equal to, to epsilon, then when we substitute this substitution for x, so c to minus 1, a, b to k, and then the c, then we obtain this word, which is not reduced, of course. Uh, first we cancel out the c's, and we get this word, and we can easily see that everything here is a power of a, b, and then when we sum the exponents up, then we get a zero, so indeed this is uh, equal to, to epsilon as desired. In particular, note that, and we will be using this somehow later on, that an that this is a solution for an arbitrary k, okay? So there are infinite number of solutions, and, uh, well, they are somehow parameterized by this power. And in this talk, as in, as in this example, we will be only using the considering the case when the set of variables contains only one variable, but by our assumption we uh, allow the usage of the inverse of the variable. So as in the example, there's the variable, but there's also the inverse of the variable. So this problem was first investigated by Linden, who showed that the solution is a finite union of so-called k-parametric sets uh, for varying k, and the parametric set is just given by a word, and some subwords of these words are into an arbitrary exponent. So this is a set defined by taking all possible exponents over those words which uh, are under those exponents. And his uh, solution, firstly, he firstly analyzed the problem from a combinatorial point of view and then used some involved algorithms, involved uh, algebraic algorithms to, to get this sort of uh, characterization. <coughs> some years after, this was improved to show that this set is uh, the solution set is actually a union of one parametric word, so there's only one exponent in such sets, although there's still a, a union of such sets. And this approach was clearly, uh, was purely combinatorial, although no al algorithm was, was given. And, well, there was an algorithm, but it was not efficient. It was exponential, at least. However, uh, one of those, there were two solutions which claimed these results, but one of them contained an error in the proof, and the other one didn't contain an error in the proof because they didn't contain the proof. So I think we should not count them in. But this result, nevertheless, was shown using an uh, approach which used heavy group theory. In particular, there was, again, there was no algorithm, and we do not even know whether there is an algorithm in the sense that the, the tools that were used were really non constructive. And the state of the art for this problem is a paper by Bermotov, Gilman, and Mesnikov, who showed exactly the same result using a purely combinatorial approach. And they also come up with an algorithm which they didn't, which has a polynomial running time, although we, they didn't really analyze the exact degree of the polynomial. Uh, there was some high, high up about it. Probably it can be lowered to something like n to five. And in this paper, we are giving a cubic time algorithm, and also some better bounds on, on this representation. So we are showing some better bounds on those words, uh, w, on those w's which occur in those parametric sets. Although this is a um, not so important improvement as the one as the cubic time algorithm. Okay, so this combinatorial <laughs> approach that was used by several people, it uh, somehow focuses on the cancellations within the words. So the first observation is, <coughs> the first notion is that something cancels within, within some words, meaning that if we have a longer word u, v, w, then this v cancels within it if there is some sequence of cancellation after which all of this v is just cancelled out, okay? So in, in the picture we can represent that there is the v and some of its prefix cancels with the suffix of u and some of it, and the remaining suffix cancels with the prefix of of v. And this, there is an old result by Nielsen, and eight, old in the sense that 18 here is actually 1918, is that if several, if concatenation of several elements in, in the free group, they are equal in the free group to epsilon, then this means that one of them cancels within the two neighboring ones. And the proof just follows by some, well, this is an easy proof, uh, 
which considers the, the sequence of cancellations. Okay, and we will be using some sort of variant of this algorithm, uh, of this um, lemma. So we, there are those words you which we are interested in, and they are also intertwined by some words S, by some S's which are not interested, and we want to claim that some of those U's cancels within the word, which extends to the neighboring U on the left and to the neighboring U on the right. And, and th this variant is proved exactly in the same way, so I will still call it the Nielsen's lemma. So if we consider the, uh, the, uh, the equation that we are given, then first of all, without loss of generality, we can assume that everything is on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side there is only epsilon, and that, uh, <coughs> and that all exponents are either plus or minus one, because in particular we allow that the words in between them are just uh, empty words. And the reason why we can move everything to the left-hand side is because we can just multiply by the inverse of the right-hand side, and then in this way move everything to the right. So if something is a solution of such an equation, so if x, an element of the free, word, uh, of the free group, is a solution of this equation, then this means that th such a concatenation is equal in the free group to epsilon. So by using Nielsen's lemma, we can uh, show that we can show that one of those x's by symmetry you can take the assume that its its power is plus one and not minus one cancels within the two neighboring uh, two neighboring uh, x's which are at some powers. Those may be plus one or minus one. Okay, and, uh, and when we look at this, oh, well, this when you consider this notion that it cancels within the two neighboring powers, then we can analyze it from the point of view of word combinatorics. And then Vermotov, Gilman, and Yasnikov showed that this allows to parameter, uh, well, given such an equation, you can give a superset of all solutions uh, to this equation. And roughly, it can be constructed in time, which is, well, the, it depends on those power of those exponents for x's, but mostly on those uh, words u, uk minus 1, and uk. And it can be constructed in the time which is proportional to the well, multiplication of lengths of those two words. And it gives and the representation consi consists of several two-parametric words, which are just some prefix, power, another power, and a suffix. And every word involved here is linear in terms of those two words appearing uh, in this equation. Actually, they are much shorter, like two. They are quite short, like the constant is two or three. <coughs> okay, in fact, we will be using a slightly more uh, refined version of this lemma. So what we really want is to have some assumptions on those u and v that they are cyclically reduced and primitive. If you do not know what it means, that there are some nice properties of words <coughs> uh, which are useful, and if we want to assume them, then this can also be proved, although we need to somehow improve the, the proof that was given before. Uh, and we separate the set of solutions into some words, so not parametric words, but simply words, and again, the bound, the, the bound on, on the number is the same. And there are also the parametric words, but here we really want the connection which, uh, between the number of such parametric words and the lengths of those words u and v. So what I would really like to sh tell you is that there, for, if there is a solution alpha u to i, v to j, beta, then there is like length of u times length of v such solutions, but of course those u and v's are different between them. So there are some lengths such that there is a O of one length times the other length, a number of such two parametric words, and those words u and v, there are of those predescribed lengths. So in particular, those lengths can be computed and they are still linear. Okay, and when we are given such a family of solutions, then one such solution, so for when i and j is fixed, it can be tested in linear time. Okay, if we do some linear preprocessing before, then it can be tested in linear time. And this is just a standard word combinatorics. So we plug in those words into the equation and we just um, do the, uh, the cancellation, which those powers can be treated somehow appropriately. Uh, we need the properties of u and v. So the fact that they are primitive, uh, cell, um, cyclically reduced, and, a couple, and the way they're actually defined. But nevertheless, this is a relatively standard proof. Okay, so this can be tested in linear time. Unfortunately, it's not true that i and j are fixed because there are a lot of, well there are arbitrary numbers so we should do something with the parameter with those parametric uh, solutions with those exponents that we don't know and in the previous approaches all the previous uh, combinatorial approaches what was done is that firstly it was showed that one of those i and j's it needs to be polynomially bounded and this polynomial somehow depended on the equation and then when one of them is fixed so we have, have only one exponent then either it is the other one is also polynomially bounded or it is arbitrary so it it works for every possible power and we know that this also can hold because we we have seen that we have seen a, an equation in which the solution was a, a solution for every power k, which which appeared in the uh, in the substitution. Okay, so they had a polynomial number of candidates, and then the, all of those candidates were tested, okay, individually for every every candidate solution. Uh, and this worked fine, although the main drawback, main disadvantage is that this doesn't really depend on the solution. So those polynomial bounds, they were, they depended on the length of the, uh, this doesn't depend on the equation. They depended on the length of the equation, but not on the form of this actual equation. So maybe something more can be done if we actually consider the equation in, in question. So before we do that, let us first think what can be done. So how much test, how much time we can spend if we uh, on, on testing the solutions if we want to fit into cubic time. So what we know is that there is a, some there are some families of solutions which are parameterized by some para lk lk prime, and we only know that the sum of those l lk and l lk prime they are linear, which means that we can only give a quadratic bound on the sum of the the. When, when we look at the, some of the multiplications, then we can only uh, give a quadratic upper bound. Okay, so testing things also takes linear time. So in order to get a 
cubic time, it seems that we can test only constant number of candidates per family. So we know that there are, in principle, quadratic number of families. One testing takes linear time, so constant number of candidates per family seems reasonable, and which would be very bad. However, uh, note that this really depends on those numbers LK and LK prime. So such a sum in which we multiply this LK, LK prime by N over LK, LK N over L plus N over LK prime, uh, those LKs cancel out. Then we have a simpler sum in which we multiply N by the sum of those L Ls, and we know that the sum is linear, so we all, then we still get a quadratic quadratic bound, even though there is, was a quadratic bound without this multiplication earlier on. Okay, but this mean, this sum implies that it, if we are given a candidate that we know that the length of u is LK and the length of v will be this LK prime. Okay, so taking into the account this estimation, it will be okay to test uh, for one such a family of solu um, for one such parametric set, n over length of u plus n over length of v candidate solutions, because then when we sum up all the, for all those candidates, then we still get a quadratic number times the linear uh, time for for testing. This will give a this will give us cubic time, uh, and this bound is quite reasonable, okay? Because it depends on the on the actual solution. This number of candidate solutions is reasonable because it depends on the number well, on this candidate solution. So in our approach, we will substitute x with this candidate solution. Although in order to process all of them at, at once, I will just use the exponents i and j, so some integer variables, to somehow try to do all of them at once. And for uh, in this way, <coughs> when you substitute it into the equation, we get some sort of parametric a parametric word. And what does it mean, a parametric word? So firstly, there are some parametric powers. So this is u or v into some power, which depends on some on the integer variables i or j in terms of power. Well, i for powers of u and j in for powers of v. And there are also some constants, um, which could be positive or negative integer numbers. Okay. And then if we want to obtain an actual word, then we substitute. Then we can substitute this variable capital A with. Uh, capital I with I and capital J with J, and this gives us a true, uh, a true, a true word. We can also substitute only uh, one of those parameters by by an actual number. And the advantage here is that uh, when we are given that, then we can actually perform operations on those parametric words without substi without substituting I or J, without instantiating them with actual numbers. And what we can do is that if there are two such parametric powers of U next to each other, then we can just join it into one and sum up the exponents. Or if there is just a u, an explicit word u, which is next to a parametric power, then we can also join it and in this word get a, a shorter parametric power. Okay, if there is a u to minus 1, then we, we would sub, uh, well, subtract 1. And I'll say that a parametric word is u simple if no such operation can be performed. So we cannot really merge any two, two u parametric powers, u powers or, or v parametric powers together. And of course, this is not unique in the sense that, well, such some u's can overlap. So there are several, if we are given a parametric word, then there are several ways in which several different uh, u-simple parametric words that we can get out of that. But it doesn't really matter for us, okay? It will be, they're more or less the same. So why this is better? So if you look at an equation, at a simple equation, u to lx equals to epsilon, then it's clear that there is only one solution. Okay, on the other hand, if we, for some reason, just substitute that sigma of x is u to some parametric power, uh, some parametric power of, of u, so u to i, then from Nielsen's lemma, we will only get that this, uh, that, well, this u to i cancels within the neighboring u to l, so that only that this i is smaller or equal to l and greater to greater or equal than, than zero. Okay, which is not really good because we know that there's only one solution. But if we apply this operation of u simplification, then we will get just one power of u, u to l plus i, which we know that it should be equal to epsilon. So we get some more information. Okay, and trying to make it more con concrete, let us suppose that we are trying to test a very simple class of solutions. So we want to just test whether uh, sigma of x equals u to parametric power is a solution. Okay, so we substitute it to, a, to the equation, we simplify it, and then we obtain some parametric word and we want it to be equal, equal to epsilon. And the lemma is that if we have a u parametric a parametric word which is u simple and it depends on only one parameter, then if uh, after an instantiation of this parameter i by by small i it is really equal to epsilon in the free group, then it means that one of those exponents after instantiation, so the value of those exponents uh, for for i is smaller or equal than three. Okay, it's not zero but smaller or equal to three, and. There are some adi additional assumptions that I would like to skip, so we really need some properties of, of u to, in order to claim that, but all of those are satisfied. And the proof is quite simple, so by Nielsen's lemma we first choose the one which cancels within the neighboring one, and then the, from u simplicity and some standard word combinatorics we can estimate that it, has, it cannot be longer than u to, u to power 3 or u to power minus 3. And this also works if we allow those extra alpha and beta at the sides of, uh, at the sides of u, so this will work if there were only one parametric power, but we know that there are two. Okay, so let us try to do the general case, if we already have this, this tool which allows us to do something interesting. So in the following, I will fix one parametric solution, uh, one par uh, alpha u to i v to j b, and assuming that it comes from some fixed uh, fragment of the equation, which has this word u to k on the left and u to k to, to plus 1 to the right. 
And there are distant cases, uh, what should we do, depending on what's the relation between u and v. So if they are the same, then this is all the inverses of each other, then this is really simple because it essentially reduces to our previous case. Okay, So the exponents sum up and this i plus j is just one uh, integer variable. So we do it exactly as in the previous case. So this is the simple one, I will not comment it on, the, on it later on. There's a second case that is u and v are not the same, but they're like shifted, so that we can represent it, uh, we can represent it um, as two words, and there are those two words, uh, one first second and second first for, for the other one, or that the inverse of one of them has this property, and uh, so that either v or v to minus one has this property with regards to u. So they're essentially the same word, just shifted. And the last case is the remaining one, so those are really different words, and by symmetry we can assume that u is shorter than the other. And I will consider mostly this, this case, the, the last case, which is the most difficult one, uh, Although some, some parts of the second case are, are similar, somehow most of them are, are simpler, but some of them are a little more requiring. But in principle, if you know how to do the last, last one, then you, can, you know how to do all the other ones. Okay, so we substitute, in this case that we are considering, we are substituting this solution for, this candidate solution for, for x. We are performing u simplification and v simplification. We are obtaining some word, some parametric word, and it would be good if there is a similar lemma as before holds, so that uh, we, if for some ij this word is equal to epsilon, then well, for one of those powers which appears in, in, in this parametric word, we have that uh, this exponent on this value i or exponent on the value j is smaller or equal to 3. Unfortunately, this is not true, and this is because um, those powers of u and v can interact uh, between each other, between them. In particular, if they are much longer, if, if, if their lengths are much different, then they can interact a lot. And so this is simply not true. But what can be said is something much more uh, humble, is that if we fix one of the parameters, so if we instantiate, if this is really uh, on i and j, this is equal to epsilon, if we substitute this into, into the parametric word, then indeed, and, and compute the v simplification, then indeed there is a parametric power of v, v which satisfies this, this um, condition, so that f, uh, psi on j is smaller or equal to 3. Okay, however, firstly, we do not know the i's, and we do not know the psi afterwards, but maybe we can say something, how this psi look like, regardless of what's the value of i. So there are two cases that uh, that can happen, is that either this power is much different after the instantiation of i equals to, to i, either it's much different than what it used to be in this original parametric word, or it's almost the same. So this much different means that there were two parametric power which were somehow merged into this, this one. This is a little technical notion because, for instance, it depends on the cancellation order, but in principle, either two different powers of v were, were merged, or there is uh, this one uh, v parametric power and all letters of some u parametric power were merged into it or some neighboring u parametric power was wholly cancelled because this also affects this, this v parametric power. And the remaining case, so that they're almost the same, this simply means that those is all the other cases so none of those happens. So this remaining case is actually is the easier one as you might expect. So if uh, if we look at this v parametric power after the instantiation of, of i, then what can happen is that it can still extend or be reduced by some neighboring letters, and due to v simplicity it cannot extend more than v letters to the left or, or right, as if the word was uh, using only the letters which originally were in in the parametric word, and it can extend to some v par to some u parametric powers neighboring it, but again not too much due to some periodicity arguments. So at most length of u plus length of v, but which is at most two v's. Uh, as the, the v is longer. Okay, so in principle, the, the constant in this exponent of, of psi can change by O of 1, which is at most like uh, 6, <coughs> which is strictly smaller than 6. Unfortunately, the argument for psi, so uh, for powers of u, is much difficult because we cannot use this argument that this is at most, uh, that u is shorter than, than u plus v could be much, could be very long comparing to the length of u. Okay, so if we know that they do not change so much, then how many different uh, how many different psi are there? So we know that there are at most n of them, but this is not enough because the, this wouldn't be enough for our uh, purposes. But what we do know is that when we look at the parametric power, then it don't, doesn't really matter what's, uh, whether it's. Uh, we know that there are n occurrences of those of those psi or, or parametric powers of v, but some of them could be the same, and it doesn't really affect our algorithm. So if there is a j plus one here and j plus one there, then this is com counts as exactly the same for us because we we are only looking at the values. So uh, firstly, we can show that all of those psi are actually of the form form j plus minus j plus c, meaning that none two of them join. In fact, this is not trivial in the sense that they can join if there are two neighboring pow opposite powers and there is a power of v in between and then can, then, can, then they disappear. And this could happen at various places and considering that the consecutive places. So it, in principle, it could lead to some joining of some, to creation of some larger exponents, but it can be shown that this is not the case. So there is always at most plus, plus minus j and plus some constant. Okay, moreover, when there is a constant plus c, then it means that there are some c C times length C V letters from the equation, and if there are different k k different constants, then this means that we used k squared times v different letters from the equation, which gives us some sort of a square root 
uh, upper bound on the number of, of different phi's. Unfortunately, this is again not true because those alpha and beta introduce letters to the equation, which makes the equation up to uh, quadratic length. But then, uh, using some standard, some arguments, you can show that uh, still that there can be given a bound on, on the total length. Moreover, this bound is uh, slightly better than the trivial ones. We actually divide by the whole v and not the, the square root. The v is not in the square root, but it's on the, the other side. Okay, so the other case is that there are uh, that the phi's are different, so that the phi um, is different after the uh, instantiation of, of i, which again mean, means uh, the definition of that is that there are two either there are two different uh, powers of v which were joined, or that some u power either was joined wholly after the instantiation of, or all of it was cancelled. And in fact, this first case is, um, implies that one of those two second ones happens, and in the third one, so that the whole V, u parametric power was cancelled. So as, again, as before, we can show that this means that some of those exponents is at most uh, that this exponent that disappears is at most three on this value of i, which gives us only constant number of candidates when we already know the the, the, the phi. For the first one, we know that the whole u parametric power after the instantiation is included in some v parametric power. But the thing is that the form of the solution guarantees that there is also always a v parametric power next to the u parametric power, and then it can be showed that this means that all of that you, that this is the power to which it was uh, introduced. So this, and since we extend only by by powers of v, then this u then this u power needs to be a prefix of a v power, and moreover, it's a maximal prefix of this property. And again, using some combinatorial arguments, we can show that there are only constant number of candidates for phi. Uh, so in both cases, there is a co only constant uh, different possible candidates, assuming that we know phi. Okay, which means that if we choose this u to phi in, in w, that this is the one which is going to disappear, then we know what are the possible values of i, and there are only constantly constant number of them. Moreover, we know that this this u to phi is the one which is going to all of those letters are going to be included in this new power of v. So we know what is going to be the, this new power of v, as we can simply compute it, uh, knowing i. And then this power is the one that we want to sh that we want this this lemma which says that. Uh, Psi on J is at most three, so we also have a constant number of uh, possible candidates for J. So in total, as soon as we choose this power of U, then we know then we have a constant number of candidates for I and J. Okay, so there are only linearly many candidates for I, uh, I and J, but it would be much better to actually say that there are n over length of U such candidates. And can we do it any better? So in fact, yes. So if we look how this U to phi is created, then it is created from some word. <coughs> which is of this form, so this beta from, from the substitution for the variable, alpha, and there is some word from the equation. So if this word from the equation is longer than u, then of course there are at most n over u such words, because, well, they use u letters. Okay, so there are also u, this number of such uh, parametric powers. And if this u to k is shorter than u, then uh, our power of u is uh, a suffix of this beta u to k alpha. And alpha and beta are fixed. The u to k is quite is short. It's lo shorter than u. Then again, using some combi word combinatorics, we can show that there are only constant constant number of possibilities of this length of this u suffix here. Although it depends on alpha and beta, but nevertheless, it's only constant once we fixed alpha and beta. Okay. So in total, either there are n over u choices for this occurrence of, of phi, which gives us uh, o of n over u choices for i and j, or there is a constant number of choices for phi. Okay. Not for the uh, not for, for its occurrence, that it could have many occurrences, but there's only constant number of different phi's, so only constant number of different i's. Okay, so summing all those cases together, what can happen is that either there are, uh, if something is a solution, so if this uh, ij is a solution, then either uh, we have a bound, different number, we have a bound on number of possible choices for i, j, or we have a bound on different possible choices for, for i, or we have a bound for choices of i and j, or there is this somehow trivial case that uh, after substituting uh, i every possible j is a solution so in the first case in this most in the simpler case so we when we have a constant number of candidates for i then we just substitute this number of i and we are getting a similar uh, a similar substitution but now just there is only one parameter and we are treating this in exactly the same way as in this simple example and we are getting an appropriate running time in this case when we look how many different choices are there then well this is the sum so we are summing over all candidate solutions this n over lk is the number of uh, candidates that we are having for one uh, this infinite family and when we do the math then we are getting a uh, multiplied by n for testing and when we do the math then we are getting a cubic time as, as desired and in the last case, so uh, that there is just the bound on, on j, then notice that there was a symmetry. So all of that is done when we are sub when we are instantiating the parameter i with well small i. But we could do also the other way around. So we can instantiate j with uh, with a fixed number, and then there would be a similar characterization with just i and j switched. Okay, and those three last cases would be also solved in the other one, uh, in in this other substitution, and that would be the first case that we should deal with. And of course, 
this characterization holds for one and for the other at the same time, so both of those bounds would hold. And again, if we cho if we test every possible i and j from one and the other, then this would be the bound on the num of total number of candidates. And again, when we do the math, then all of all of those l k's they cancel out. The square root is two times, so it will be removed. So there will be some like that, and again, it's it's cubic, okay? Which means that all of this algorithm will run in running time uh, in cubic running time. Thank you.